Okay, we're in uh, Genesis <clears throat> chapter 13. And um, we had taken a look, I think, a little bit, um, beginning with verse 7. <clears throat> but uh, I think tonight we should be able to um, really see <clears throat> that the story of Abraham, as well as the book of Genesis, is pretty much... I mean, everything I can see, it's all about the firstborn and who is the firstborn and finding the firstborn and then the firstborn doing what he does best, sacrifice. Um, <clears throat> but when I first, before I started the, the uh, bef I think I was still in the prodigal son teaching and I had not, I had already begun to see this for a while, and I hadn't really shared it yet, <clears throat> but then I made a statement that we're going to be getting into the book of Genesis, and I said, um, I said, um, I, there is not a place in the book of Genesis that doesn't have to do with the firstborn, and I, oh, I said that to somebody, and they said, uh, well, that's weird, you know, how do you explain that, and I said, well, take your Bible, <clears throat> And just find Genesis and then just open up and do this and I'll show you the firstborn. <laughs> and they said, uh, um, okay, yeah, I'm ready. So they did it and we ended up in Genesis 13. And he was going, now how in the world does this relate to the firstborn? Well, tonight we're going to actually really see not only it relates to the firstborn, but this is the... This is the father's first really big declaration on uh, having the uh, oomph behind what he's saying because it's moving closer. Every step is moving closer. All right, so um, we are going to read verse 7 through 13. <clears throat> and there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. It is not, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Um, verse 12, And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked sinners, wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. <clears throat> All right. It's really the next verses that, we will, that we're going to show this. But, um, so you remember that the land was, was given to Abraham, was promised to Abraham, and then it was also promised to his seed. <clears throat> And I wrote, why then would Lot be squabbling over what was not his? Um, and the answer is because all of this journey, all the way from the Ur of Chaldees, from Babylon, he has thought because of Abraham and everything that he was the firstborn. And so he's squabbling over the land because he thinks it's all his. Right? Now, we didn't find him squabbling before because now he has uh, come out of Egypt. Remember, it said that Abram came out of Egypt with cattle and this and that and a whole lot of stuff. Okay, But it also says Lot did also. So for the first time, Lot has his own lot. <laughs> And he's got his own stuff, and he's got his own riches, and he's got his own thing, and he's being lifted up. 
He's being lifted up because he thinks he's the firstborn, which is the exact opposite of what the firstborn does. And he's being lifted up. So now he's fighting with Abraham's herdsmen and squabbling over land and stuff like that. And so Abram comes to him and he says, you know, we don't need to be fighting and stuff like that. You just you, you pick whatever land you want. So he picks this beautiful part of the land. It's well watered and everything about it. And he does that thinking, this is Abraham giving me the right of the firstborn. Okay, now this is what the person who opened this book and pointed to, and I started. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now I, I'll, I'll read a little bit here, but it's the next couple of verses, don't read them yet. It's the next couple of verses that really show this is absolutely true because the person I was sharing this with was like, okay, until we got to the next verses. But let me just read some of, of my notes here. Remember the land was given to Abram. Why then would Lot be squabbling over what was not his? He did so because as presumed firstborn and due to circumstances, which is Abraham or Abram's... Uh, misguided attempt to have a firstborn soon as God says something. Okay. Well, God says stuff to us. Did you know God says stuff to us in relationship to Christ coming forth had, that hasn't come forth for years yet? And we go, oh, you know, I mean, you can handle that several different ways. But one way is you can handle it like Lot did, where he's thinking, well, this applies to me because Abraham, who is now my surrogate daddy, because my dad passed away, has acknowledged me as such. All right, so that's the deal. That's going to be the deal throughout Genesis is that the brothers are always going to think that they're the firstborn over the one that God picks. And because of that, there's going to be division. Okay, so we say, well, what is the big problem in the Middle East? If you've ever read anything online written by an Arab in relationship to Abraham, I have. Here's what they say. Abraham was the father of Ishmael, and Ishmael is the father of, you know, us. And... They say, and on through uh, Esau and on through. <clears throat> so they say that Ishmael was the firstborn, which he was the firstborn in terms of birth order. But he wasn't God's firstborn. Okay. And I don't want to jump ahead too far with that, but that that starts signaling you that there is a, that there's an issue there. All right, so then as you read on into their writings, they say that Abraham offered up Ishmael. And saved him, as it were, from dying. And so the whole thing has been turned, but my point of even bringing that up, and there's so much more that goes with that, but my whole point of bringing that up is to say the, the initial issues were over who's the firstborn. And that's why they say the land belongs to us, and the Jews say the land belongs to us. And they say Abraham gave it to Ishmael, the firstborn. And the Jews say he gave it to Isaac, the firstborn. And they say he's not the firstborn. Look at the scriptures. Look at even your scriptures. See that? You see that? All right. So that's where it all, the whole thing, the land, the fight, the, the, the angst, um, all relates to, you know, what was funny is when I was reading all this and st the Spirit of God started showing me all this, I'm going, I may have the key to the problems in the Middle East. <laughs> hmm, this could be the root cause of the problem. Anyway, 
uh, knowing what the problem is and getting people to, you know. Uh, so, let's see. God's word to Abram about the land usually referenced that it also belonged to his seed, right? When, he, when God would talk to him before he went down into Egypt, he mentioned that unto thy seed. With every word that comes forth, Lot's going, I knew it. I'm the firstborn. Abram said that I am. And he brought me. I'm the only one in the whole family that came all the way in here to the land that's mine. And so when he goes into Egypt and comes out rich, he goes, yeah, I'm getting bigger and stronger. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Hey, Rocky. Anyway, too bad Joseph wasn't here to hear that. Anyway, um, so now he's, he's squabbling with the herdsmen of Abraham and Abraham because it says, you know, why would there be division between you and me for we're brothers? We're brothers. So, uh, well... Therefore, Lot fought for what he thought was rightfully his. Okay. Because if you're really the firstborn, you, got, you may have to fight for it, right? Wrong. If you're the firstborn, you may have to lay down your life. <laughs> you don't have to fight for it. You have to stop fighting. Which, what did, what did Abram do? Take whatever you want. If you go that way, I'll go this way. You know? And Lot, as the, the supposed firstborn, picks the best. Because the, because the firstborn gets the right of the firstborn. You see? See how that works? All right. Uh, but the thing that qualifies one as the firstborn in the eyes of God is related to conformity to the true and only firstborn, the true and only, that's the Lamb of God, that son must be in us, formed and prepared for sacrifice. Lot was so deluded about who he was and his place in the scheme of things that he probably thought Abram was treating him as the firstborn and giving him the best of the land. And then I wrote, what about us? Do we carry ourselves with a sense of entitlement? You know, a whole lot of problems and divisions that happen between people in the church, a lot of time is because someone gets their feelings hurt or they don't get, they don't get the respect that they thought or they, don't get, they get treated a certain way or certain things are being used more by somebody else than them or whatever. You know, all this stuff that really are that sound like the elder son. Why didn't I get this? How come this didn't mind? Why didn't somebody acknowledge me? Well, because you're not really the firstborn. Well, how do you know? You just proved it. You just proved it. You just proved that Christ, the firstborn, has not come forth in you. You're just claiming it. You're just, you're just saying it is because... Because uh, God said it goes to the firstborn, and you know you're born again or something, and, or, or you think that you're the most anointed or the best or the one who knows the word best or the one who is, you know, whatever, strong as clear, you know, has more leadership. I have more management skills. I have all this stuff, you know. And that's, by the way, that's the basis that a lot of people think God raised Jesus from the dead and set him at his own right hand because he's the best man for the job. That wasn't it. It wasn't because he was the best manager. It was not. It wasn't because he was his son, the son of God from the beginning. It wasn't. Then what was it? When he laid down his life, he proved he was the firstborn and God exalted him. (laughs) 
And see, it's a little early, I mean, in a certain sense. I mean, we see that uh, somewhat in the uh, story of the prodigal son. We definitely saw that in Cain and Abel. Okay. Um, we will definitely see that in Abraham's story. We will see that in Jacob's story. We will see that in Joseph's story. Big time in all of them. It's big time, even in Jacob even though we miss that. It's big time. I mean, because we go, okay, well, Isaac, yeah, he took him up on a, on a mountain and da-da-da-da, and, you know, you know, he's little, Isaac's going along and going, what? we got the fire and we got the wood, but where's the lamb? <laughs> I'm not real. I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> I'm so sorry. That is not what he did. <laughs> and I don't know why I would think that. <laughs> God help us. Uh, instead, he said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice, a lamb. And he did. He gave himself. And the father gave his only begotten son. He provided himself in the form of his son. Uh, and we see it in Joseph big time, right? I mean, in the story. But we go, well, Jacob, I don't know. Oh, man, you know, I just keep telling you that I can't wait to get to Jacob. I am telling you, it's just, it is gloriously beautiful. And so that when I'm talking now, see, it's a little frustrating for me because when I'm talking now, I know that you haven't seen it all the way through yet. So when I say certain things, you're, going, you're dealing with a little pittance of what's been shared so far. But I am telling you that the, many of the things that I say now, they are m magnified way out there as we go further in these stories. All right. Um, but the thing that qualifies one as the firstborn in the eyes of God is related to conformity to the true and only firstborn. That son must be in us, formed and prepared for sacrifice. Lot was so deluded about who he was and his place in the scheme of things that he probably thought Abram was treating him as the firstborn and giving him the best of the land. And then, I, then what about us? Do we carry ourselves with a sense of entitlement? Do we squabble over things, treatment? respect or should I should have put lack of respect you know well people should see see what I really am okay I think they are <laughs> I don't know I'm just telling you I'm just, I think they I think they got you figured out it's not that hard um, <laughs> but but we but but we don't see that actually when it's working in us. Did you know that? We don't see that because we're full, we're full, we're not empty. And when you're full, then you feel confident and you feel like, you know, I've got a handle on this. And, you know, and then when that, you don't get that back, you go, well, why aren't they full of my fullness? You know, why don't they see all this fullness that I have from the Lord that makes me over them, firstborn. It makes me special. You know, God, God exalted the Lamb of God, set him on the throne, every knee shall bow, innumerable, saying, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor. We, we really, we know the stories but those stories have to just like reach out and grab us and pull us in to the reality that is the Lord behind that, that God said, that spirit is what I'm going to exalt and put over everybody, and everybody needs to get in. I'm going to put them in the kingdom of my dear son, which is the beloved son, which is the firstborn, and their knee should be bowing to that, and their spirit will be him, and I'll divide the goats, the, the lambs from the goats, the nature of this from the nature of that. And God said, this is it. This is what I want. 
This is what I care about. This is the only thing that I care about in the, in the long run. It's his son, but, it's, but the proof of his son is that he comes in a certain way. Comes into Jerusalem, everybody's saying, you know, you know, with the, the, the what are they, bamboo, <laughs> it's not bamboo, oh, yes. poor Deb's going, ah, because she's allergic to bamboo, <laughs> it's like, ah, ah, I, anyway, um, sorry, and <laughs> I just get into all this stuff, Tom, um, and, uh, and the scripture says he comes in lowly riding on a donkey. And they're all going, this is him, this is the Messiah, this is the one. And he's, he's riding on a donkey into Jerusalem so they can get off of it and go to the cross. He's not thinking, it's happening right here. This is, this is my time. This is, I knew the Father would, you know. And these fan palms are incredible this is the height of glory really <laughs> and remember a bunch of these people are going to turn around shortly within the same day or night and and start yelling crucifying so you know those palm those fan palms be careful who your fans are because <laughs> they're for you one moment and they'll say crucify you the next. Okay, well, the lamb doesn't worry about that stuff. I just want to tell you, the lamb is not, he's not going, oh no. Randy said that they'll be for you one minute and they'll crucify you the next. I wonder who it is. Well, it's pretty much going to be everybody, <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, and the truth is it doesn't matter to him. He's not holding grudges or going, he's not looking at, you know, uh, you know, Bartholomew and going, man, you remember the time you didn't, or, you know, all this kind of stuff. He's, he is not being murdered. He is not being abused. He is laying down his life. Yes, in their heart, maybe they are murdering and abusing, but he doesn't, that doesn't, matter to him he came to be a sacrifice and to me you know that spirit on the cross when he says father forgive them for they know not what they do and he's he can barely breathe from the way that the cross takes your breathing away and everything else he's in major pain and that's what he's saying and to me to me that's more strength than the ability to do great miracles or 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 you know have a silver tongue, be a silver tongued orator. Wait a minute, am I quoting the first part of 1 Corinthians 13? <laughs> it says, though I have this or that or da 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 da, sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, if I have not love, which what is love? By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to. See, it doesn't stop with Jesus. That same spirit's supposed to be in us. It's him, it's him, it's not us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Where am I? <laughs> or do we regularly show the firstborn through us in sacrifice, willingness to lose, and always moving to lift others higher than ourselves? Okay, so, you know, the word sacrifice is very easy to, or let's put it this way, it's not a really good word. It should be a great word. It's not a very good word because we've all got our little list of what sacrifice is. Well, yeah, I sacrificed today. I did this and I did that and da-da-da-da. And, you know, I mean, the things we're listing off, just for example, if it was a mom, we're listing off all these things, are probably the same things a regular mom is doing because she's a mom. You know what I mean? You take care of the kids. You do without. You help them. You, your focus is there, you know. You, you spend all your money to help them instead of for your own benefit and stuff like that. So we can take many different scenarios and call that sacrifice and say, yes, it's the firstborn in me because I do all of this, when even sinners may do that. All right. So sometimes I write extra things to help, like willingness to lose, and particularly lose so others can gain, 
and particularly the others in Jesus' case was the people who turned against him and hated him and wanted him dead. Okay, I'll die so that you'll be blessed, so that you can be taken care of, so that you can be forgiven, so that you can be loved. Apparently, you know, I have the, I can see Jesus saying, I have the love of the Father. Apparently, you don't really know how, you don't know what it is to be loved. So, I'll love, even if you don't see it, even if you never acknowledge it, even if you never get the benefit out of all this, my heart is for you. Okay. That's what I meant. <laughs> and, uh, and always moving to lift others higher than ourselves. Well, to lift others higher than ourselves. Some people um, can look, look at it like, you know, it's the Christian mountain and we're all climbing it and whoever gets to the top first is firstborn or king of the hill or whatever. I don't know. You know, he's somebody special. He's to be acknowledged. You know, Paul kind of used that, but he used it in relationship to a race. You remember that? He said, the actual Greek there in Galatians chapter 1 is that I was out distancing all my brethren in the what? The Jews' religion. In the Jews' religion. Not in the Lord. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, he's, he thinks he's doing good. And, you know, he's, you know, and who knows how many other people might have been ahead of him. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, that's just his opinion. You know, I was out distance and know all of them. Yeah. The Lord goes, well, not so fast there, Scooter. You know, <laughs> so, but to him it was a race against others, you know competition against others so that I can get there first so that I can you know and I, you know I've seen that in I saw that when I was in Bible school I've seen it in this Bible school at times uh, over the years and the different classes that we've had where people are like in competition to see who's going to come to a revelation of Christ quicker which is the best way not to ever come to <laughs> You know, but but you can understand that thinking, right? I mean, yeah, you know, but it's wrong thinking, and it's and it is absolute proof that it's not the firstborn in you. You 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 see, isn't it interesting? I get to say that a lot. You just prove that it's not the firstborn. I get to say that a lot because those kind of things are the exact opposite of Jesus. Exact opposite. And the thought just came to me, if, you know, if Jesus was really trying to impress everybody in the way that you impress people in the world, he wouldn't have been, you know, raised in Nazareth, which I'm sure some of you know, but it was a really, people, the Jews basically thought that's they're a bunch of heathen up there, you know. And uh, partially because it's up north and it's closer to the border where the Samaritans are and da-da-da-da. <clears throat> but... And, and look down on him. Is, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Remember that phrase? Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> One thing. Um, and can, uh, you know, I mean, if I was Jesus, if they said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And I was from Nazareth, I'd say, can any good thing come out of you? <clears throat> anything. Just I'm just fishing here. Got anything in there? Which pretty much proves that I'm not the firstborn. <laughs> but he is in me. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So here we go. Praise God. We're going to get to, we'll get into these scriptures right now. All right. So let's just kind of have a quick flashback. Don't read those scriptures yet. Let's have a flashback. God speaks to Terah the father of Abram, they come out of the Ur of Chaldees. They're supposed to go into the land. They get to Haran, which is just across the border from Canaan. Um, 
they get there and they stall and they stay and they stay there for a while. And finally, God speaks in chapter 12 to Abraham and, and says, leave your kindred, leave your country, leave your, and he wasn't talking about where they came from, he's talking about Haran. And come into the land, into a land I will show you. Okay, so then he gets into the land, he goes into the land, and um, God speaks to him again. Um, about the promises, and he makes an altar. And then, you know, he gets to um, in between Ai and uh, Bethel, and again, God speaks to him, and he makes an altar. So he's making these altars all along the way, and God is speaking to him about one thing. God is not, well, two things, the land and the seed. And he's not talking about, you know, um, if you'll if you'll be you know you know if you'll be a Christian <laughs> if you'll be um, you know my guy uh, I will really really you know make sure that you never have any problems and you know <laughs> you know that sort of thing and you're going God never said that. He promised, and then he even shifted it before he went down into Egypt and said, unto thy seed all this is. Okay. So you got Lot going along with him and all this. They go down into Egypt. You remember the whole mess. They come out. <clears throat> he goes back to the place of the altar, it says, that he left when he went down in Egypt. Goes back. He goes back to the altar. He picks up where he last heard from God. Right? Okay. So then there starts this argument, and, and God hasn't spoken. In fact, I think it's probably in my notes here. God hadn't spoken to him since Egypt and up to this point. It's been quiet. That would mess with you if you're used to hearing his voice and building altars. No altars, no voice, no God talking. You know, we would go, what did I do wrong? Well, don't say, what did I do wrong? Say, Lord, what did I do wrong? <laughs> or, you know, you see what I mean? We always go, what did I do wrong? And then we try to figure it out. Well, it probably violated you in some way or whatever, and just speak to me because I don't want to do that even if I did it knowingly, <laughs> right? Can you say that? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So here we go. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. Is that significant? Lift up now. Now. After he's gone. Now that he's gone. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Okay, so what's the first thing he says? The first thing after, after the supposed firstborn lot is gone and out of the picture, the first thing he goes is, okay, now I want to talk to you. Now we've got a relationship. Now we're back on track. It has to do with the firstborn, and he wasn't it. Now we can start moving forward in this stuff. Amen. Yes, Lord. This is where that person's finger landed. <laughs> the one up above about them arguing, and then I went down and said, okay, right here. This is, this is proof. That this is about the firstborn. All right. So, um, <clears throat> verse 16, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. All right. So, clearly, God has been quiet once, once he left the place of the altar and ended up in Egypt. All the time in Egypt. All the time when they got back to the place of the altar. All that time until 
a big argument happened between the supposed, the pretender firstborn, Lot, is arguing over what is his. And I'm, I deserve it. Do you hear the, the, the elder son in the prodigal son story? I, this is mine. I deserve this, you know. And so Abram approaches it like a firstborn himself, because he was, by the way. <clears throat> he approaches it like a firstborn, and he says, take whatever you want. You choose. It doesn't matter to me. Let there be no strife. We are brethren. Does this sound like a fairy tale lifestyle? Or does it sound like Christ? And Lot takes the bait. And when he does, he's out of there. He separated himself because of the things that were in him that were not firstborn. You cannot blame God, folks, and you cannot blame Abram. He did it out of the lust of his own heart for things of the firstborn. We're not even talking about rank sin stuff. We're talking about the things of the firstborn. But his understanding of the things of the firstborn, this is, this is one of the beautiful parts of also Jacob is that the thing, what are the things of the firstborn? And even Jacob, as Jacob, yikes, he didn't get it. He, he, was, he was messed up like we all are until we get the firstborn formed in us. Right? All right. <clears throat> um, it was no accident that Scripture mentions Lot coming up out of Egypt with Abram. God was tired of Abram thinking of Lot as his firstborn son. Therefore, God did not speak to Abram even after Egypt until this point. He was tired of hearing about Lot. Can you imagine Jesus, his firstborn son, the one that he loves and everything, and then sticking Lot in there? Think about Lot's life and the way he ended up and the whole thing. Do you think the father would be, I am sick of this. Abram, you've got to get with me. Amen. So he, do, he, he gets with him by having that spirit that doesn't grasp and hold like Lot's doing. And when he has it, then everything starts breaking apart so that it can fall into the right order. And then the father goes, okay, I'm here. Now we can talk about the firstborn without your silly mind going to Lot. Okay, right? Or you. You know, a lot of you. All right, so therefore God did not speak to Abram even after Egypt until this point. It is also significant that God never, ever spoke to Lot. Never, ever spoke to Lot. Dude, you need to quit acting like you're the firstborn. <laughs> This, you know, you're way out of your league. <clears throat> All right. But though God's voice had been withheld, it was now instantly released the minute something came about. What was it? And the Lord said unto Abram after that Lot was separated from him. The separation of Lot seemed to move God to speak. It moved him. It moved God to speak. But why? This, this was the removal of the supposed firstborn that had been in Abram's mind. But God knew all along that Lot was never his choice as firstborn. Man. I, this word just came, just comes to the impostors. Yeah, yeah. Robert said the ones who, who think that they're the firstborn really are coming as imposters to God, at least. Right? Did I say that right? 
Yeah. <clears throat> um, there must come a separation first. Before God wants to talk about his son, we have to start, you know, like Jonah or like the people in the boat with Jonah, you start throwing everything out until finally you throw him out. Yeah. <laughs> or shall I say, in your boat, you need to start throwing stuff out until eventually we throw you out too. <laughs> there must be a separation first. The thing or the one that we have always assumed was God's firstborn, that's speaking of us in spiritual form. We have assumed that we were the firstborn. The, the one we have always assumed was God's firstborn must be identified, unloved, because we love ourselves, folks unloved, remove, which I put in parentheses, remove our love from ourselves Amen. and separate it from, which is also necessary or which also necessitates what? An altar. So what do you think Abram's going to do next? <laughs> of course. See, I don't make this stuff up. I don't, this just comes, this just is so easy because it all, through Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then Joseph and then moves into Exodus and the Exodus out of there having to do with the firstborn and then it just keeps going and the tribe of Levi becomes the, the, the only ones who would be as the firstborn to him because they would sacrifice regularly lambs. I don't even know what to say. It's just, to me, it's just overwhelming because, but see, I'm, again, okay. <clears throat> These verses are proof that all of this story is about who will be the true firstborn. So there is this, there is this seeking for the firstborn. And I think in a certain sense, we're kind of like, you know, Abram, when we first get born again, but we think we're that firstborn, and we really think that we're, you know, oh, and, and you know, I mean, it feels good to be saved and in the family and so, so many things, but we're not the firstborn. And in usually in those early days, we don't even know there is a firstborn, we, and if there is, it has to be me, you know. Um, these verses are proof that all this story is about who will be the true firstborn. It is important to go back and trace the beginning part of this chapter. There God elaborates the importance concerning the land and the coming seed. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So why? You know, God is saying, okay, arise now. Arise. Walk through the land. You have to possess this, Abram. You cannot just grab hold of the first thing that comes along. Now, is he, does he have it all together now when it comes to the firstborn? No, he's still got several more pretenders that will come up. But he's on track. See, we go, why do I keep making the same mistake? Well, because we're dummies. But we, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have a Father, and we have Jesus as our life. And if our heart is set on him, it'll be set on altars, and we'll keep, we'll keep bringing up those altars. Amen? Because... God didn't do the altars. Abraham did. So, so to me, I always look at it like there's a lot of hope, even in the midst of ongoing failure, which is, you know, 
Abraham really didn't get this settled until, what are we in right here, 13? About 10 more chapters. I don't think he read Romans 4, but anyway. That's... All right, so notice that the separation was not just about Lot being removed, but about Abram moving from the place where he had held Lot as the firstborn. Arise, walk through the land now. Then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is Hebron. What's Hebron mean? Fellowship. But here's the good news. Probably next class we'll deal with, with Hebron. But he moved to a place of fellowship. And, and that place of fellowship, what is the most identifiable fact? Is it the worship? Is it the... Is it the, the great gatherings that they had of fellowship? What's the greatest, greatest thing about Hebron that identifies it as what God would call fellowship? It's the place they all got buried. The place where they all got buried. Yeah, fellowship. Made conformable to your death. Fellowship in your sufferings. Okay? Um, the carnal mind holds on, doesn't it? But that location removal by Abram was not merely from a certain place which was not named, but unto a specific place. That place was Hebron, which means fellowship. Also notice that the fellowship that took place there was based on altar fellowship. All right, so even though it's a little early, we're going to stop there because... We want to meditate on what he's given us and not just be in gluttons. But y'all got to admit, man, this is, this is so wonderful. The word of God is just, and it just goes like this, one after the other, one, verse after verse after verse. Chapter after chapter, chapter, he never drops and goes off. Not, you know, I know there's places along this line that we go, well, what, about, what about that? Just, you know, hang in there because it's all going to lead to another level of firstborn. Father, we just come to you in Jesus' name. We are desirous not just for you to speak to us but yes speak but speak of your son and speak speak quantities of your your son to us so that it tips the scales in our carnal mind and then begin to reveal that that son is already in us but we have him overshadowed because we keep choosing Lot or Eliezer or Ishmael or something else. We just, it's just hard for us to get hold of what you're saying because we're so self-centered. We don't want to be like Lot. We don't want to misread what it means to be firstborn. First of all, it is Christ. It is not us. Second of all, it involves lowliness and, and, and sacrifice and self-giving on a level that few understand. And yet it, that's your firstborn. That's who he is. So we, <clears throat> we ask you to do what your full intention has always been to do. We just want you to know that our hearts are with you in that intention when we ask. 
we believe that you're not going to do it just because we ask, but because that's your intention, and we're with you in that. And we say amen. We say amen to that. So be it. So be it. Have your way. Let your spirit do what he's called to. And Father, you do what you know as a father must do in this process. And let Jesus be exalted as he's seen as a slaughtered lamb. Let him be exalted as we find him as a slaughtered lamb on a throne, exalted, but we found him. We're not looking at the throne. We're not looking at the exaltation except as seeing what it is, Father, in your heart, how high he is in your heart compared to all others, all others, men, women, doesn't matter. So we love you. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We, we love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.